Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 11 of Advanced Linear Algebra, which is all about composition of linear transformations. So the idea behind composition is it's just applying a linear transformation and then applying another one, right? Remember that linear transformations are functions, so we think of them as doing things to vectors. Well, what if you want to do one thing and then another thing and then another thing and then another thing? Well, if you want to do a whole bunch of things to vectors in sequence, one after another, that's what composition is. It's just multiple linear transformations all applied in sequence one after another. Okay, so here we go. Here's how we get off the ground in this lecture. Okay, so we define the composition of two linear transformations. If S and T are my original linear transformations, then S with a little circle between it and T, that means S composed with T or the composition of S and T. And that's a new function. And what it is, how it acts on vectors V from the vector space, is it first applies T to the vector and then it applies S, right? Remember that functions sort of, they, they work inside out. So what this means is V is being fed into T and then that is being fed into S. So T is being applied first and then S. Okay, and similarly, you could do this for composition of three or four or however many linear transformations you like, okay? Now, you, you can define composition for, for arbitrary functions acting on arbitrary sets, but when we're working in vector spaces and working with linear transformations, something really nice happens. And in particular, we, we just talked about standard matrices last lecture, and it seems very natural to ask, well, what can you say about the standard matrix of the composition of two linear transformations? And what this theorem says is, well, all of this is just sort of standard setup. Let these be vector spaces and these be bases of those vector spaces. What the theorem is saying is that the standard matrix of a composite linear transformation is just the matrix product of the individual standard matrices. Okay, so in other words, composition is modeled by matrix multiplication. And in fact, that's exactly why matrix multiplication is defined the way that it is. It, remember matrix multiplication, when you were first introduced to it, it has this weird, long, ugly formula. And maybe you were wondering, like, why is matrix multiplication defined in that way rather than just entry-wise or something like that? And the answer is because we want this theorem to hold. We want this to happen. We want matrix multiplication to correspond to doing one thing and then doing another thing, right? Doing linear transformations one after another is what matrix multiplication does. All right, so a bit more formally, suppose you got three vector spaces, V, W, and X, they're all finite dimensional, so we have standard matrices in the first place. And then again, to have standard matrices, you need to fix bases of those vector spaces. So you got bases B, C, and D, all right? And then just suppose that you have uh, linear transformations, T is going from V to W, and then S goes from W to X, okay? And the important part here is that sort of these middle vector spaces, they match up, okay? S has to act on the output of T, right? Because we're doing T first and then we're doing S. So, you know, these middle pieces have to match up for the right types of things to go into these linear transformations. All right, anyway, so if you've got all that set up, then it turns out that S composed with T, that's a linear transformation as well. And what it does is it just sort of skips the middleman. It goes all the way from V to X. Okay, and furthermore, it's standard matrix, just like we just said, it's the product of the individual standard matrices. And again, notice that we designed the notation here so that it works out really nicely. Over on the right-hand side here, we sort of have the C's matching up here, and they, you can think of them almost as canceling out, and you're le just left with B going all the way to D. Just like on the left-hand side, B goes, the, the B basis is sort of mapped to the D basis. Okay, so, Let's prove this theorem, okay? And the way that we're going to prove it is we need to show that S composed with T applied to a vector represented in the D basis is equal to this big mess over here. Okay, so before we actually show anything, let's think about why that would be a good thing to, sh to show. Why would that help us prove this theorem, okay? And the reason is we know from the previous lecture that S composed with T applied to V, well, that equals... Uh, the standard matrix of S composed with T times the coordinate vector of V. In other words, it's going to equal the same coordinate vector times the standard matrix of S composed with T. So it'll equal this standard matrix times VB. Okay, so if we can show that it equals instead this matrix times VB, and that's true no matter which vector we pick, then these must be the same matrices, okay? It is a fact that if you have two matrices, call them A and B, if A times V always equals B times V, 
then actually A and B have to be the same matrix. That's the only way that can happen. Okay, this is sort of just the general principle that functions, they're defined by what they do on their inputs, vectors in this case. Okay, so if we can show that this is the same as this, then we're done because we'll have that, hey, this matrix equals this matrix. All right, so how do we show that? Well, just use theorem 3.1. That's the theorem from last class that told us how standard matrices behave. Okay, so I'm gonna write down this right-hand side. Okay, I'm gonna start with this expression over here. I write it there, and then I focus on this term over here. T, the standard matrix of T times V, Okay, well, theorem from last class, that that's just equal to the coordinate vector of t of v. This, this part over here turns into t of v represented in the c basis. And again, we think of the b's as canceling out because they match up there. All right, and the s, the standard matrix of s just got carried along for the ride and didn't do anything with it there. Okay, so that's theorem 3.1, a couple pages up. And now we're going to use the exact same theorem again. Here I've got standard matrix times coordinate vector. Ah, great. I have a theorem that tells me that equals coordinate vector of the output. All right, so it just equals S applied to T of V in this output basis D. S applied to T of V in the output basis D. Great. Okay, and now my last step is just, well, S of T of V, that equals S composed with T of V. So it's just a change of notation that I did in that very final step down there. Nothing fancy. Okay, and that's great. That's exactly why I wanted it to equal, right? So I'm basically done. The rest is just sort of explaining what I already explained a little bit, okay? So because, um, because I know that S composed with T, the standard matrix of S composed with T times the coordinate vector of V equals the coordinate vector of S composed with T of V, okay? Again, that's theorem 3.1, the theorem from last class. Then what do we get? Let's just trace these equalities through here. This guy, standard matrix of S composed with T times V equals this, which equals standard matrix of S times standard matrix of T times coordinate vector of V, okay? And because this is true for all of these, I know this matrix must equal this matrix here. They're the same matrix, and that's exactly why I wanted to show, okay? So theorem is done at that point. All right, great. And before we get on to sort of our main example, we're just gonna have one big example in this lecture, but there's one special case that's really important to, to note. And that is we can use all of this to define powers of linear transformations, okay? So if your linear transformations S and T are the same as each other, then, well, you can compose a linear transformation with itself as long as its input and output spaces are the same, okay? If, in other words, if the vector spaces V and W are the same. And well, you can sort of iterate that as well, that you can compose all sorts of times. So what we do is we say that the case power of a linear transformation is just it composed with itself a total of k times. Okay, so for example, t to the power 1 is just t, t to the power 2 is t composed with t, and so on. However many times you have that t on the right-hand side there, that's the power. Okay, and the previous theorem tells us that, well, if, if you want to compute the standard matrix of a power of a linear transformation, you can just compute the power of the standard matrix, okay? So it's, that's just a special case where all of the, the, the linear transformations in that theorem are the same as each other. All right, so let's go through an example here to sort of get an idea of, of the power of this type of theorem, okay? Let, let's get a sense for, for how far we've come actually with these linear algebra ideas. Let's actually solve a calculus problem using linear algebra, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use standard matrices and this new theorem that we have at our disposal to compute the fourth derivative of this function here, x squared times e to the power x plus two x e to the power x, okay? So normally, if you're to compute the derivative and, and second derivative and third derivative and fourth derivative of this function, what you would do is you would compute the derivative of the first term, that's gonna involve the product rule, then add on the derivative of the second term. Uh, that's also going to involve the, the product rule. And, and then you would have to do that over and over and over and over again when you take the second derivative, third derivative, and so on. All right, so this approach using linear algebra is going to be kind of nice just because you avoid a lot of the sort of technical messy calculation when you do that. All right, so the setup here is we're going to have to work in some vector space uh, and the derivative transformation on that vector space. And the vector space that we're going to choose is going to be the vector space um, sort of consisting of functions that look like x squared e to the x, x e to the x, and things that we get when we take derivatives of functions like that. So I'm going to choose my vector space to be the span of these three functions here. So again, you can see I've got the x squared e to the x, x e to the x, I'm also gonna throw an e to the x in there because when I take derivatives of functions like this, because of the product rule, I'm gonna get some e to the x's on their own as well, added in 
uh, added and scalar multiples of them added to functions like these when I start taking derivatives. So I'm just throwing this e to the x in there so that everything's closed and my differentiation map, uh, you know, it doesn't get me new functions that are outside of the span of these three functions here. All right, and this set B here, it really is a basis of its span. So in other words, the set B is linearly independent. That's maybe just an exercise that you could uh, solve using the methods that we went through back in week one. Okay, so what we're going to do now that we've got sort of our basic setup, what is a vector space, what is our linear transformation? What we want to do is we want to compute the standard matrix of the fourth power of this linear transformation and apply it, multiply it by the coordinate vector of this function here. All right, so here's how we do that. First off, we have to construct the standard matrix of D itself. And the way you do that, we went through this last lecture, you plug in each of the, the, each of the basis vectors into that linear transformation, and then you compute the coordinate vectors of these things that you just computed. And you, you compute these just by taking the derivative using the product rule, okay? So I said we were gonna solve a calculus problem using linear algebra. We're cheating a little bit because we had to do a tiny little bit of calculus here, but that's the only calculus that we'll do, okay? The rest of this just really is purely linear algebra, okay? All right, so these are uh, the coordinate vectors of D applied to the basis vectors. And then what you do, same thing as always, to construct the standard matrix, you stick those in as columns, okay? So one, zero, zero, that's my first column. And then one, one, zero, that's my second column. And zero, two, one, that's my third column. All right, great. But I don't want the standard matrix of D. I want the standard matrix of D to the power four, okay? Well, Fortunately, to get to d to the power of four, all we have to do is maybe the easiest way to get there. You could you could do d times d times d times d, but maybe instead I'll just square and then square again, right? If I square twice, I'll get up to the fourth power. So the standard matrix of d squared, that's the square of the standard matrix of d, right? That's what our previous theorem tells us, okay? Uh, the, right, the, the standard matrix of d composed with itself is just the standard matrix of d times the standard matrix of d. Okay, so we just multiply this matrix by itself and we get 1, 2, 2, 0, 1, 4, 0, 0, 1. Great, that gives us the standard matrix of D squared. I want the standard matrix of D to the power 4, so I square again. And this time I just get this matrix again. You just multiply the square by itself. Okay, and now we're almost done. Okay, now we can compute the thing that we want. What we want is we want D to the power 4 applied to that function that was given back up in the statement of the example. Okay, so I want the fourth derivative of this function. Well, the way that we can compute that is standard matrix of d to the power of four times the coordinate vector of this function. We already computed the standard matrix, it's right there. And then the coordinate vector of this function, again, our basis is just e to the x. How many e to the x's are there in here? Zero. Next vector in our basis is x e to the x. How many x e to the x's are there in this function? Ah, there's two. Okay, and then third basis vector is x squared e to the x. How many x squared e to the x's are there in the, there's one, okay? And, oh, sorry, it's right there, okay? So the coordinate vector of this function is just zero to one. And then you just do this matrix multiplication, you get 20, 10, one. And so that tells you your answer. That tells you your fourth derivative is just 20 times the first basis vector plus 10 times the second basis vector plus one times the third basis vector. And then you're done, right? So we just sort of went backwards to how we usually do things. Usually we go from vector to coordinate vector. Here we're sort of undoing that. We're going from coordinate vector back to vector itself. All right, and one of the really nice things is once we get later on in the course, we're gonna do things like find formulas or find a method for coming up with formulas for arbitrary powers of arbitrary matrices. So we'll be able to do things like take whatever power we like of this derivative matrix, and we'll come up with a formula for whatever power we like, and that will give, in turn give us a formula for whatever derivative of a function we like. Okay, so it just gives us sort of a very, very standardized framework for doing things like this, for applying powers uh, of linear transformations and solving, you know, multiple derivative problems, for example. Alrighty, so that does it for today's lecture. I will see you all next time when we'll start talking about change of basis for linear transformations.